Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> it's a beautiful day outside today. Now, as you can tell from my accent, I'm English. And if you've ever visited my home country, you probably will have noticed two things. The first one is that the weather is pretty bad. And the second one is that English people like to talk about the weather. Quite a lot. Now, admittedly, it rains a lot of the time. But it's not that bad to justify how much we talk about it. Sometimes you would have the impression that British people talk more about the fact that it rains than it actually rains. But here's the thing, and today I want to let you into a great British secret. When an English pe person comes up to you and says, it's a beautiful day outside, or more, more likely in England, it's a miserable day outside, they don't really want to talk to you about the weather. What they want to do is to say, I would like to talk to you. Would you like to talk to me? They're just too British and reserved to walk right up and say, hi, my name is Claire. You see, the weather for us is a way of starting a conversation. One of Britain's most beloved prime ministers of all time, Winston Churchill, was famous for many things. His love of Armenian cognac, of course, but also his quotes. One of his less famous quotes is, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. Well, Mr. Churchill, I am that average voter, and I would beg to disagree. Today, I want to talk to you about conversations that, to my mind, are the most important we can have. Conversations between us and our government. These are conversations that can have a profound impact on the way we live our lives and the way our society is organized. Why is that? Well, the government delivers us public services, which we hope will make all of our lives better. But also, if we don't tell the government what we're thinking and what we're experiencing between the ballot box, if we're lucky enough to vote, how can they possibly know? Years ago, I was living with my family in, in Bangalore in India, which is a pretty crowded and chaotic city. And I looked out of the window one day of, of my house and I saw that the streets outside were eerily quiet. Gone was the crowds of traffic, the tuk-tuks, the hawkers with their piles of coconut. And instead, there was just a couple of ladies in saris bent over, sweeping. And this one man painting with a machine a nice, clean, white line down the middle of the road. Now, I went downstairs and I went to our neighbor's house. They were Indian. And I said, what on earth is going on? A politician is coming to visit, they told me. And this is the route through the city that he will take. Now, if you're a politician and you only see the good bits, or you only see the Potomkin villages, how can you really know what's happening in your country? In the past, some leaders have gone to quite bizarre lengths to try and get around this problem, to try and get directly to the word on the street, to get past their advisors. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Stealth King, but when we lived in Jordan, that was the nickname of King Abdullah. King Abdullah used to like to walk around the streets in, in Amman, incognito, dressed as a, a journalist, and to speak to Jordanians directly about their experiences of government. Perhaps he'd been inspired by the king and a thousand and one Arabian nights who used to creep out of the palace at night, dressed and wander through the crowded streets and bazaars and mingle with the lives of his citizens. Now, Wearing a mask or disguising yourself is one option, and in the past, perhaps it was the only one. Nowadays, arguably, whether you're a king, an elected leader, a bureaucrat, it's much easier to tell your people what you're doing or to get that word on the street using technology. For example, where I come from, the state provides free health service. And in the past, let's say you had an aunt who needs heart surgery, you would go along to your doctor or to your local hospital, and you would be assigned a general practitioner or a surgeon, 
and from there you would hope for the best. Now the National Health Service has opened up all of its data on performance of its doctors, of its surgeons, of its hospitals, and it's estimated that this one act of transparency has helped save the lives of a thousand people per year. In Taiwan, the government has literally opened up its data set on everything from procurement to water quality to pollution. Now, opening up data sets and making government data public is not a new idea, but with the internet, it's having much bigger impact and it's helping citizens take more informed choices. As another example, let's say you're walking down the street and you look up at a construction site and you see on the second floor a young boy working. He has no helmet, no, no colored vest, no safety harness. And I think in any country that would be a pretty shocking sight. And you might want to alert your local authorities to that. But you probably wouldn't know where to start. Well, in Montenegro, a team of teachers and students developed an application and hotlines so that citizens could call their government and tell them exactly about black market violations. In two years, over 7,000 cases have been reported. And what I, I like most about this example is two things. The first one is that the government has committed to fine the perpetrators, but they also allocate a part of the fine to community projects that the community votes on itself. So it's ever likely that lots of people call in to, <laughs> to complain, I guess. But the second thing I like about that example is that the teachers and the students were responding to an open call for ideas from the government. The government was literally sourcing ideas from the crowd for problems that they faced. And in this case, technology and new techniques were bringing ideas from the streets and bazaars directly into the offices of government, of the people who manage the public services. Now, when we started experimenting with innovation in governance and crowdsourcing here in Armenia a couple of years ago, it was something people told us would never work. We Armenians, we're too individualistic to spend our time coming up with ideas for the, the common good. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I'm pleased to tell you that in the couple of years that we've been doing this, not only do we have thousands of people contributing ideas, but the, one of the reasons people told us that this would never work is they said, look at Armenians, their apartments, how beautiful they are, and look at how awful the common areas are, always peeling paint and full of rubbish. And one of the ideas that people have given us is exactly for the better management of those common municipal apartment buildings. We've been using crowdsourcing here in Armenia with the municipality to help tackle a range of one-off issues from transport in Yerevan to accessibility with people with disabilities. The next step will be for the government to scale this up across public service. And if it did that, Armenia would be one of the first countries in the world to achieve it. Now, as with any idea, any new idea, any new technology, there are always advantages and disadvantages, challenges and opportunities. And these kind of new techniques and new technologies can help government bring new ideas from citizens into, into their offices. But it has to be more than just window dressing, otherwise to make themselves look good, because otherwise we're all going to just get frustrated. On the other hand, not everybody has access to a laptop, to the electricity, or even to the internet. And of those that, not every, of those that do have that access, not everybody will contribute. So technology will be part of the story, but it will not be the whole story. But still, are governments around the world ready for this? On the other hand, as a citizen or that average voter, it's never been easier if you're willing to be proactive to implement your ideas. It's never been easier to go from, I wish my municipality were better at cleaning the streets, to, I have a good idea for cleaning the streets and to implement that idea and then scale it up. 
I was talking to an ambassador here in Yerevan the other day, and um, here is somebody, you know, he's at the top of his profession, he's hugely influential, and he appears regularly on television. But he was contrasting his influence with that of his wife, who's a prominent blogger, and behind her computer screen with a cup of coffee has an access to thousands of people who follow her every word. What's my point? The point is the power of the people to affect change nowadays can depend as much on the institution that you work for as the ideas and the networks that you have. The ambassador versus the blogger. But I've been struck by something else as we've been working on this. And that is, as citizens are increasingly being expected to participate and to come up with ideas, so there is a responsibility also from our side to participate. You know, before we could just go to the, the ballot box once every four years, we mark our check, uh, our check in the box, and then we sit back and complain for the next four years that nothing's going right. But not anymore. The citizen has increasingly moved from the listening role to the talking role, and then the acting part. So the logic of the conversation between the government and the people is changing. No one knows what tomorrow might bring, let alone five or ten years down the line. But as Ban Ki-moon has said, the United Nations Secretary General, we must close the gap between the world as it is today and the world as we would like it to be. And that is all of our responsibility. Governance is increasingly becoming a collective action. And more than ever before, as citizens, we can expand our circle of influence and reach out. And that starts with the conversation. Perhaps as a first step, governments can start by asking, how is the weather, wherever you are? Thank you.